Hello everybody and welcome back. So we're just going to pick up right where we left off. We're looking at this problem where we were comparing the salaries of uh, alumni from the TRU School of Business and Economics in three different majors, economics, finance, and marketing. We went through the ANOVA exercise. We had a very small p-value which gave us very strong evidence in support of the alternative hypotheses, which means that it is therefore necessary to perform the Fisher's LSD to identify where the difference exists. So let's get into it. We will be using a 10% level of significance. So the first step, as with all tests, is to state your null and alternative hypotheses. The Fisher's LSD procedure breaks down our sample into a number of, of two population tests. So we need to take our samples, here we have three samples, and compare two at a time, going through all three of them. So luckily with only three samples, we only have three tests to do. If we had more samples, well certainly the number of tests that we have to do increases quite rapidly. If I have four samples, I suddenly need six tests. So having three samples, here I'm going to compare the mean of economics to the mean of finance. Are they the same? Yes or no? We're going to compare economics to marketing. Are they the same? Yes or no? And finally, our last one we are going to compare finance to marketing. So those are the only three possible comparisons that we can make with our three samples. Now, I'm just gonna clear away some space here. This one's gonna require a few more calculations. Fisher's LSD, we're going to use a what I think is the simplest approach for this Fisher's LSD, there's really two approaches. One is called the confidence interval approach, and that's what we're going to do here. Although we're not actually going to be calculating confidence intervals, but it's based on the relationship between a confidence interval and a two-tailed test. The other approach is to do a simple t-test. And I can show you the formula for that, but we've already covered t-tests long ago in module 10, so we're not gonna go through all of that again. The approach that we'll use, the confidence interval approach, uses as a test statistic, simply the absolute value of the point estimate of the difference between all of the different sample pairs. So I'm looking at those sample means between economics and finance and economics and marketing and so on and so forth. Then for this approach, we use a critical value that is called the LSD. That LSD is calculated as T alpha divided by two, because these are two-tailed tests, we're using alpha divided by two. This is based on a confidence interval approach, although we're not calculating a confidence interval. But always, those confidence intervals use alpha divided by two. And this gives me MSE times one over MI and one over MJ. Now, in this exercise, we have different sample sizes. So we are not going to be able to just calculate LSD once as we did in the first problem in this module. We're going to have to calculate a separate LSD, a separate critical value for each of our three tests. So this can be a little bit time consuming. Luckily for you, you've got that fast forward button on there. So our test statistics first. So these are just differences in sample means. So I'm just going to clear this up a little bit here. So the first one, 96, 213, minus next one, 94, 315. So that gives me a point estimate of the difference of 18, 98. 
Okay, the next one we're comparing economics and marketing. So I want to compare these two. So 96 to 13 minus 92 for 16. That gives me a point estimate of the difference there of 37.97. And finally, finance and marketing. So now I'm looking at these two. 94.315 minus 92.416. That gives me a value of 18.99. Okay, now, for our Fisher's LSD, the first thing that I need is that critical T. Now, this is going to be the same for all three of them. The only thing that changes in all three of them are going to be those sample sizes. So I need to know degrees of freedom. Here, we're doing this at the 10% level of significance. So alpha divided by 2 gives me 0.05. Our degrees of freedom always correspond with our estimate of the variance. And here, the estimate of the variance that we're using is MSE. So I come up here and I can see MSE has 175 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to go to my T tables and I'm looking for 175 degrees of freedom. Again, I don't see it. I'm going to round that to 100. Now it seems like a big difference from 175 to 100, but if we compare our values, so here's our 0.05 for that alpha divided by two. So let's come down here all the way to the bottom. So there's the value that I'm going to use, 1.66. Now, again, I'm rounding from 175. But if we even compare the difference between 100 and 1,000, it's a very small difference in that T value. So rounding from 175 to 100, not a huge loss of accuracy there. So my critical T I'm going to use is 1.66. And then this is going to be our MSE which here, oh my gosh, this is such a large number. This is going to take a little while to calculate and to transcribe. 38, 260, 710, 0.64, okay. And then our sample size. So here I have to be careful that I use the right sample size. I'm comparing economics and finance. So my sample sizes there are 54 and 63. Of course, it doesn't matter what order I put them in, 54 and 63. So let's go ahead and calculate this one. 3826710.64 times 1 over 54 plus 1 over 63 square root times 1.66. So that gives me an LSD of 1904. Okay, there's our first one. Moving on. Next one, now we're comparing economics and marketing. So, our critical value is the same, 1.66. Now I want our MSE. MSE is the same, 3826071064. Our sample sizes for economics is the same, 1 over 54. Our sample size for marketing is 61. Okay, let's go through this one. 1 over 54 plus 1 over 61 times 3826071064 square root times 1.66. 
That gives me an LSD here of 1918. And finally, our last one, 166, same MSE. And my sample size for finance, well, I already have that one up here. That's 1 over 63. And my sample size for marketing, I've got that right here, 1 over 61. 1 over 63, 1 over 61, times 3826070.64 square root times 166. I'll be glad to be finished with these calculations. 1844 and some decimals. Okay, there we have our LSDs for the test. The rejection rule. The rejection rule is that we reject if our test statistic is greater than or equal to that LSD. So if I go through here, the first one, 1898, it's less than our LSD. Do not reject. I have insufficient evidence to show that there is a statistically significant difference in the average salaries of economics and finance. Comparing economics and marketing. Here I can see that my point estimate is greater than 1918. Here I have evidence to reject. I do have evidence to show there is an, a difference in the average salaries between economists and marketers. The next one, 1898, that one is also greater than, although not by much, but that's okay, it's also greater than that LSD. I have evidence here to show a statistically significant difference in average salary between finance majors and marketing majors. So that's it. We've gone through this whole problem where we first performed the ANOVA analysis to determine whether or not we had any evidence to show a difference in the average salaries between these three different majors. Now, upon finding a difference, fairly strong evidence that there was a difference, now we're doing the Fisher's LSD. We've done the Fisher's LSD to identify, well, where is that difference? Which one or which ones are different? Calculating those test statistics and those LSDs and applying this rejection rule that if the test statistic is greater than or equal to the Fisher's LSD, we can reject. We find evidence to show that there is a statistically significant difference in the average salaries of economics and marketing and finance and marketing but we are unable to show a statistically significant difference between economics and finance. So between these three, marketing is the one that is different. Okay, now, I also said I would at least give you the formula for how to do this as a t-test, and it probably won't come as too much of a surprise. You look at the difference, in those sample means, and you divide it by a standard error, and the standard error here is something very familiar, MSE 1 over NI 1 over MJ. This is a two-tailed t-test, like any other. You can find a critical value, degrees of freedom correspond with MSE, you can find a p-value using this approach as well. The outcomes will be exactly the same, whichever approach you use. You'll get entirely the same conclusions. This one is referred to as the confidence interval approach because, well, as you might have seen, as you might be able to recognize, the calculations that we're doing, the, the formulas, well, it's all the components of an interval.
although we're just looking at it as a test statistic, we're just looking at this in absolute value. And this is based on the relationship between a two-tailed test and a confidence interval. And without getting into too much detail in this lecture, in this practice problem, certainly any time that point estimate of the difference is greater than or equal to this margin of error, whoops, then that's consistent with an interval that will not include zero within the limits. And hopefully, as you recall from module 10, that relationship between an interval and a two-tailed test is one that if the interval contains the hypothesized value, that supports the null hypotheses. If it doesn't contain the hypothesized value, that supports the alternative hypotheses. So if this were the case, if the point estimate were less than that margin of error, well, that interval is going to include our hypothesized value, in this case, zero. And so that would support the null hypotheses. And of course, if it is greater than or at the margin equal to, zero is not contained within that interval. Yes, it will be the limits, but what matters is, is it within the interval? And in this case, it is not contained within the interval, and so that is consistent with a rejection. Okay, I didn't want to get into that in any more detail. I'm sure even many people already hit stop and went on to other things, but there you have it. Okay, I hope that this was a helpful video. We've gone through a lot in this one. Thank you so much for watching. I think I've got one more exercise in a, a single factor ANOVA uh, doing an observational study. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.